Hello, here we are again with Tyndale Bible Church Online. I hope you're enjoying our studies together as we stay at home awaiting our Lord's will regarding this virus. Thank you all who have remained faithful in your giving. We know these are trying times and are very thankful for our family members who are able to contribute to the needs of our ministry. Thank you again. Well, it's the second hour, so y'all are ready to return to Romans. Now, before I get started, did y'all listen to Josh Bailey yet this morning? If not, please plan on listening to his teaching after we finish here with Romans. So if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Romans, chapter 8. And let us go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the time you give us here together. Uh, this is just a, a wonderful way that you have set up in our world of today, this ability to communicate in other ways, Lord, than just being in a group, although we do miss sincerely being together as a church family, Lord, and we uh, can't wait for that day when you restore our time together, when we can once again come in here and be all together as a, as a local church body to, to worship you together through study and through song, Lord. But Lord, we thank you for this ability you give us, and we just want to use it to the best of our ability to communicate your word uh, with our, to our uh, congregation here, Lord. Thank you, and guide us now, Lord, through your word, that we might grow one step closer in the maturity you want us to achieve, that all might be done. In Jesus' name, for your greater glory, we pray. Amen. Okay, last week, our brother Leon took us through a glorious section of chapter 8 of Romans. We saw how believers are sons and heirs of God and how we will have a glorious deliverance, as will creation. A glorious deliverance for which we and the creation now groan as we await that day to come. We also learned that we currently have the first fruits of the Spirit, which refers to the Holy Spirit himself being the first fruits of God's work in our reborn lives through his baptizing, indwelling, and sealing activities to validate our justification and begin our sanctification. Today we will learn more about the Holy Spirit's work in our lives as he follows the will of the Father for each of us. And we will be giving, given an outline of God's salvific method and the security it brings to each believer. Let's begin our study by reading verses 26 and 27 of chapter 8 of Romans. I will be reading from the New King James Version. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Well, let's start with verse 26. First, we have a small textual variant. The Greek critical text has the word weakness in the singular. The majority text in the Textus Receptus have it in the, in the plural, weaknesses. Not a big difference. But a few things stand out in this first sentence. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. Likewise, or in the same way that the Holy Spirit acts as the first fruit of our salvation through his baptizing, indwelling, and sealing, he also helps with our weakness or our weaknesses. This word helps here is interesting. The Greek word from which it comes speaks of two people joining together to take hold of something. You know, like when you help your neighbor move a big tree limb or carry that new sofa into the house. This is the way the Holy Spirit helps us. He is there to lend a hand to pick up the other end when we are weak. And the thing to remember here is that Paul was not expressing this as something which happens on occasion. No, this verb helps here is in the present tense, meaning that the Holy Spirit is continually helping us in our weakness because we are continually weak. And Paul gives an example of what he is talking about. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, 
The New King James, the King James, the English Standard Version, and the New International Version all translate the neuter noun, pardon me, the neuter pronoun, tis, in this verse as what. We don't know what we should pray for. The New American Standard and the Net Bible translate that same pronoun, pronoun as how. We don't know how we should pray. That Greek pronoun allows for either translation. And the fact is, our Lord spoke to his disciples both concerning content and method in regard to prayer. You'll see that in the Lord's Prayer in both Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15, and Luke chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. In either case, Paul makes it clear that even with our best efforts, we don't always pray as we should because there will always be needs in our lives which only the Holy Spirit can communicate to God. We may not truly know them. We may be trying to avoid them. We might just have the wrong mindset concerning them. Thankfully, because we are weak, the Holy Spirit is there to pray for us, and he does this with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, some say that this passage should not be translated this way because they believe the Holy Spirit cannot groan. Instead, they read this passage as the Holy Spirit interceding for believers while the believers groan, which then says that we have groanings which are unutterable. Although this may seem like a truly unique quality for the Holy Spirit to have, we know that he can be quenched and we know that he can be grieved. So I think the clear reading of this passage is that the Holy Spirit here has groanings which cannot be uttered. This Greek word translated as groanings is stenogmos, and it means a sigh or a groan, often associated with concern or grief. And note that these groans of the Holy Spirit cannot be uttered. The New American Standard says, too deep for words. The Net Bible says, inexpressible groanings. The Greek word here is the word alaletos, which means unspeakable or unutterable. This is a Greek word with the negative particle alpha added to negate the meaning. So you have a laletos, or not speak, or not utter. This is not something that can be given a charismatic spin to try to justify speaking in tongues because this is the Holy Spirit communicating directly with the Father, spirit to spirit, in an unutterable manner which is beyond our understanding. He is speaking on our behalf. In this relationship between the Father and the Spirit in regards to this making intercession on the part of the Holy Spirit is clarified further in verse 27. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. How's that for a verse that describes the intimacy that exists between the members of the Godhead? Now he who searches the hearts, who is that? Well, that is God the Father. Let me submit first Samuel 16, verse 7, where Yahweh is speaking to Samuel about David. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And how about Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So the Father knows the hearts of men, and the Father knows the mind of the Holy Spirit. So although both know what man needs, based on the hierarchy set up by, in the Godhead from eternity past, in which the Son proceeds from the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son, the Spirit is resident in the believer, in communicating with the Father over the needs of the believer. Nothing need be said between them because the Father knows the mind of the Spirit, which relays the needs of the believer. 
And the Father knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit is interceding for believers according to the will of God. That's how most of our translations puts it, with the words the will of in italics. The actual Greek just says according to God. What this is telling us is that the Holy Spirit is making this intercession for believers because it is the Father's will that he do so. Just as, it is, just as it is one of Jesus' tasks in heaven to make intercession for believers before the throne of God, so too is it the Holy Spirit's task while resident in each believer to make intercession to the Father on our behalf by helping in our weakness to pray to the Father as we should be praying. What a gift and blessing this is to each of us. It is something for which we should be thankful every day. Now the Apostle Paul will switch gears and speak about believers in our interaction with God the Father, starting with the present and looking all the way back to eternity past. Let's begin by reading verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. This, of course, is a very well-known Bible verse and one which presents a truth which may be difficult for us to deal with on occasion, that being Paul's opening statement. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. The New American Standard Translation adds a bit more of God's sovereignty to their translation of this verse. It says... And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So, folks, that includes COVID-19 and its repercussions. Political parties in power that you may not care for. The loss of loved ones. The loss of savings. The loss of jobs. The loss of health. Being incarcerated suffering identity theft, the list goes on and on. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. The things themselves may not be good, but God uses all of them through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to contribute to our ultimate good. And one of the main reasons that they do contribute in this way is because they drive us back to God. In the case of those events which we consider hardships, they show us our inadequacy, our inabilities, and hopefully force us to turn to God with a greater dependence on and trust in Him. And this action only takes place for those who love God. Love here is the Greek word agapao, meaning the ultimate form of love, the love with which one is willing to put someone else first in their lives. All things work together for good for those who put God first in their lives because of their love for him. And the only people on earth that fit that description are those who have embraced Jesus as their personal savior. But Paul gives believers another name in the second half of this verse. To those who are the called according to his purpose. These are the ones who love God with an agape love. Paul here calls them the called in my New King James Version. However, the definite article isn't in any of the major Greek texts, so it actually says, to those who are called according to his purpose. But please note, whether your version says called or the called, the emphasis is that these people were given this status because it is according to his purpose. So the first thing we learn here from Paul is that this is all about God. It may involve a glorious result for us, but it is all about God. And it is according to his purpose. Paul then explains just how this took place. Let's read verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, first we are told that God foreknew us. What does that mean? Well, the English is actually a great translation of the Greek, which is the word prognosko. 
a compound Greek word from pro, which means, in this case, before, and gnosko, which means to know. So we have progenosko, to know beforehand. In other words, God knew each one of us before we were created. This is speaking of what took place in eternity past when God was putting his whole plan together. And please also note that no conditions are placed upon God in this passage regarding his foreknowledge of all believers. Some schools of theological thought place a requirement on God regarding his foreknowledge, one in which he must wait to see a person choose his son as savior before he can predestine him. In that case, we have a couple of problems. One being that God does not then foreknow the person. He foreknows the actions taken by that person. He foreknows an event. And nowhere in scripture are we given that as a requirement put upon God in order to save someone. Also, if God must wait in order to see whether or not a person accepts his son as savior, then God is not omniscient. In that case, even if the length of time he has to wait is only a nanosecond, then God does not know everything. He does not know the end from the beginning, as we are told in Isaiah 46.10. I'm not sure that most of those who hold this view of foreknowledge have embraced this other required facet of their view of God. And scripture affirms the omniscience of God, contrary to their view. No, folks, when we read that God foreknew believers, this is all about God. This is God in eternity past choosing the elect from a world that will be lost in sin. This is God graciously saving some when in reality, he was not required to save any. We were all sinners, deserving of hell and damnation. But he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Luke also spoke of this regarding Gentile believers in the book of Acts when Paul and Barnabas were in Antioch and Pisidia. When Paul let the Gentile listeners know that salvation in Jesus was also available to them, Luke tells us this in chapter 13, verse 48. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed, let me read that again, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. This term appointed is a translation of the Greek word tasso, which is a military term meaning to assign or to appoint. And that is exactly what happened. Their commander-in-chief, God the Father, appointed them because he is the one in charge. He is the one who decides, not us. The rest of verse 29 here in Romans tells us what happened to those whom God foreknew. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We speak sometimes today of our personal destiny or a person achieving their destiny. Destiny is seen by some as a predetermined course of events which mark out your life. And others see destiny as a similar course, but one which you yourself may influence or change. Here in this verse, we are told by the Apostle Paul that there are those whom God foreknew, who we call believers, or Christians, or the church. And in addition to each of these individuals being saved, we see here that God also predestined. He determined a major feature of the life of each of these believers, that each one would be conformed to the image of his son. This is speaking of the Holy Spirit's work of sanctification in our lives, the work he undertakes to conform each one of us to the image of our Lord Jesus. We know this work will not be completed for any of us this side of glory, but significant growth can take place in a believer who yields to the work of the Spirit in his or her life. A beloved professor of mine from another Bible school where I studied used to say, it is the Holy Spirit's job to conform us to the image of Christ 
and he will do his job. Now we can fight him all the way and be black and blue and bloody, or we can cooperate with his efforts and have a smoother ride, but he will do his job. And that is what the Apostle Paul is telling us here. Remember, just two verses ago, we read how the Holy Spirit interceded for the saints because it is God's will that he do so. Well, that theme continues here. God the Father has predestined each believer to be conformed to the image of his Son. And it is the, Father, the Father's will that the Holy Spirit accomplish this task in our lives. So get with the program. Stay in God's word and let the Holy Spirit work through your life. And we are told here that the Father is doing this, that his Son might be the firstborn among many brethren. This word firstborn is the Greek word protococcus, which means firstborn. So there's no surprises here. But I wanted you to see that word because of an English word we get from this. The word prototype, which is the first rendering of something, the model after which all copies are based. And that is true of us. The Father has given the task of conforming us to the image of his Son, to the Holy Spirit, so that it will be accomplished. Every day we should move one step closer in spiritual maturity to the image of our Lord so that we will appear as little Christs, as Christians were first called in the city of Antioch, according to Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And one day Jesus will stand as the firstborn, the first to be resurrected and glorified, our prototype, and we will stand there with him, and we will be, and he will be, the firstborn amongst many brethren. The Apostle Paul then gives the details of how this works in the life of every believer. Let's read verse 30. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. In whom he justified, these he also glorified. This is simply the process leading from eternity past with our predestination to the advent of time on earth when an unsaved person is called. This calling may take place in many ways. The witnessing of Christians to us while we are still unbelievers, our hearing Christian radio, television, going with friends to church services, reading a tract, any and all of these things may occur on multiple occasions during the life of an unbeliever, and God uses all of these to call us to him. Then after he finishes gifting us with grace and faith for this purpose, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we are justified, and one day we will be glorified. Notice that the Apostle Paul here speaks of our glorification in the same tense as the other aspects noted. He speaks of it in the past tense as if it has already been accomplished. He may have done this for one of a few reasons. Perhaps he was seeing our glorification as already having been accomplished because God is faithful. God has promised glorification to the believer and he has accomplished the calling and the justification in our lives. So we can consider glorification as guaranteed. Another possible reason could be Paul's thought process. Perhaps he was thinking in a Hebrew mindset when writing this and wrote it with the Hebrew prophetic past tense in mind in which the past tense is used to express certain things which will occur in the future. Once again, because God can be trusted to do it. This prophetic past tense is found numerous times in the Old Testament. Or perhaps Paul used the past tense because we are to see the glorification as already having begun in each believer. Not fully accomplished, but having just begun. Please also note that Paul here only includes three events. The calling, the justification, and the glorification. He left out the sanctification. This was probably done because sanctification involves not just the work of the Father, but also the cooperation of the believer. These other three aspects have no input from the believer. They are all accomplished by the Father alone. 
So today the Apostle Paul has given us a treatise on the powerful work done by the Holy Spirit in our lives on a daily basis, making up for the deficiencies in our prayer life as he acts in obedience to the will of the Father. And the powerful work done by the Father in bringing us back to him in the first place, his great love and compassion, calling us, justifying us, and one day glorifying us in heaven when we will stand behind our Savior, our prototype, the first fruit among many brethren, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In these troubled times, rest assured that nothing can ever separate that bond, that plan of God for each believer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for these detailed revelations you give us through the Apostle Paul and the assurance they should build in our heart and in our mind. Lord, we see throughout Scripture that you are faithful. Great is thy faithfulness in everything, Lord. You say something will come to pass and it comes to pass. You say something will stop and it stops. Lord, everything you have shown has come true. So, Lord, we have the utmost, the greatest confidence in knowing that your promises for the rest of our lives and our eternal future are secure as well. We thank you so much, Lord, for this confidence and assurance you give us, not only for our daily Christian lives, but of, especially in times like this, a, a time like this which we have never experienced before, Lord. Uh, we have this virus running around the entire planet, and there are many, Lord, who see this and who are living in fear. Lord, I hope none of our folks are living in fear, Lord. Please let them be assured by your scriptures here, Lord, so that none listening to this will live in fear, that we will trust in you, Lord, and trust in your result no matter what it is, because your plan for each one of us is the best plan, Lord. It's so much better than our individual plans, Lord. Yours is the, the righteous, the ultimate, the totally perfect plan for each one of us. So let us rest assured in that and embrace that, Lord. And instead, let us go forth, Lord, when we can and still be your witnesses to the world, Lord, and, and stand in your confidence, Lord, that everything is going according to your plan, whether we see it or not, Lord whether we realize it or not. And Lord, let us also rest assured knowing that we are to be in prayer. And for those things that we pray for imperfectly, we know the Holy Spirit is picking up the slack, is helping carry us along, Lord, and picking up the other end of things, Lord, and taking us through and praying to you in the correct manner. Thank you, Lord, for this. Show us this day, Lord, how to do it all for your greater glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, as we prepare to go off and get ready for this coming week, please remember to stay in prayer for our world, for our country, for our church, and for all of our brothers and sisters. Pray for health and provision for all, and feel free to pray for the quick end of this virus. So let's end with a hymn to our Lord. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you.